do till tomorrow. You know what your trouble is, don't you? You just don't want work. Do you bother to look through the adverts in the newspapers? What papers? We only get the one in the morning. There's nothing in there. You know there isn't. Oh, you could have gone down to that reading room, couldn't you? Here am I, working yourself to death, and you can't even stir yourself to go and look through a newspaper. What sort of job would they have for me? There's plenty of jobs for them that take the trouble to look for them. Yeah, and they ask you what experience you've had. Well, you've had experience. Not the right kind, though. Just drop it. No, I won't. It's the same every time. Luke! You know as well as I do why I can't get a job. Been out of that place seven weeks now. Oh, don't let's wrap it up. If you mean prison, say it. Everyone else does. You can't go on like this. Well, what am I supposed to? Just tell me that. Oh, why are it in me that I'd have a son like you? I suppose you'd rather have me like Kenneth Barlow at number three. And what's wrong with him? Let me tell you something. He'll have no trouble getting a job because he's got it up here in the upper story and that's where it counts. I sometimes wish you were more like them Barlows. At least they're not rowing all the time. Well, just for one afternoon, we've managed to pull her off the street. Pat Phoenix, or as we know her better, Elsie Tanner. Hello. May I say, after 22 years, you're looking better than you were in that first piece on Burley <laughs> Coronation Street. You mean I'm wearing well? <laughs> Whatever way you want to put it. Yeah. It must be strange, actually, looking back on some of those old episodes. I find it very enjoyable, actually. Um, it's uh, full of no nostalgia for us, too. And when you think that most of those episodes were made live at the time, that we were actually going hell for leather while we were making those things, and no idiot boards and no retakes, um, it's, it's, it's pretty good, I it's think. It's quite amazing. In yeah. fact, there must have been an awful lot of hairy moments and mistakes during the live takes. Strangely enough, not during the live takes. When we uh, started to put it on tape, then some strange things happened. Uh, for instance, there was one particular occasion where uh, we had to have a frying pan start to smoke on the fire, on the um, gas cooker. And it did more than smoke. It... Uh, blazed up about six feet high. <laughs> but it was at the end of a tape, and we couldn't, uh, we couldn't stop because we were running out of time. So we just gagged the scene in, and I remember Chris Sanford, who was Dennis's best friend at the time, jumping on the table, on the frying pan, <laughs> stamping out the flames <laughs> while he had lived around it. And, you, I mean, has there been a few occasions uh, when you've got words all wrong and all mixed oh, up yes, and I, you've had to go on? I, I know you won't mind me telling you this, but my mate, uh, Len Fairclough, Peter Adamson, his famous one was, um, he had a line about, that fellow's got a, a brain the size of a pea, you see, and it, it actually came out, went out, live on the telly. That fellow's got a pea like a brain. <laughs> <laughs> he was the only one in the studio that didn't know he'd said it, and the rest in the Rover's Return was sort of hiding behind pines. <laughs> oh, it went out, yes. When you get very short of time, you see, you can't retake, and we've only two days to do it, so, you know, it had to go out. Did you really think that you would be still in it after 22 years? And now that you ask me... No. Um, <laughs> no, not really. I, who, who would have thought? I mean, I thought that if it ever did take off, which I thought it would, we'd have a good 12 months run in it. And here we are, 22 years later, you see, mm -hmm. and older and wiser. And I heard you say that I was broke and unknown. Well, now I'm known and I'm still broke. <laughs> <laughs> Were you totally unknown, in fact, when you first joined No, the no, I'd, I'd done a lot of theatre and a lot of touring around. I've been in the business since I was 11 years old. Don't ask me how long ago that is. Hush my but, mouth. But, uh, you know, I'd been in the business for a very long time, in theatre mostly, which I must admit is my first love still. But that audition day, um, I gather, was quite oh. a crucial turning point. Well, let me say that it was at the time and the uh, television screens were filled with, shall I say, British roses, you know? Um, everybody was terribly nice. And it was, good afternoon, ladies. We are now going to talk about knitting tea cloths. <laughs> and uh, they were all very chiselled featured and very, you know, very nice ladies. And, and uh, I felt there was no place in television for me. Uh, with this sort of nose and, you know. And uh, I was sent for for this interview, which I was very reluctant to go for, because I thought, well, I, I can't, uh, I don't stand a chance. And I was most aggressive um, during the interview. I walked in and instead of finding one person, there was a, a, a jury of six, you know, sort of sitting and looking, you see. And what I didn't know was that I behaved in exactly the right way to get the part. I sort of said... Um, well, don't phone me. I've phoned you and tripped over the chair and dropped me umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was Elsie Tanner. Um, 
I was at that time, she said modestly, much too young for the part. <laughs> but I caught up in the meantime. <laughs> <laughs> but um, there was a little controversy over that. And I often get people to say, oh, you look much better now than you did then. Well, it's not true. In effect, for the first six months of the series, because I was too young for the part, I had plenty of weight on, that did it. Still got plenty of weight on. <laughs> Can't lose that stone, you know. <laughs> and uh, they... Um, they lined me up, uh, very subtly lined me up, and the hair was taken back to make it more severe and age me. And then after a time, they decided that I'd established that character, and so they left the makeup off. <laughs> and that's why people think I look much better today than I did. <laughs> I don't really. More lines. But yeah. when, when you think, though, about living with Coronation Street, two episodes a week, um, you know, 12 months a year, <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of very hard work. Oh, it is. For instance, we get two and a half days, or two days exactly, to learn Coronation Street. That's both episodes. On Wednesday afternoon, we do what is called technical run. On Thursday afternoon, we tape episode one. And on Friday, we tape episode two. There's a deadline. We stop at 6.30, and there's no margin for error, and there are very few retakes, and it goes hell for leather. And if you know what, studying two episodes a week for 22 years is like it's like riding a bike uphill it really is it's very hard work you know which means that ultimately coronation street must have taken over all your lives in fact it just becomes a way of life does it not well it does but we're all sort of schizophrenic all of us you see i mean we manage to live our own lives in when we were at home with the door shut and and amongst ourselves but we have a great standing joke um a dear friend, um, uh, I think if you remember, Jerry Booth in the series who died, Graham Haberfield. When we were ready for a take, um, when we start taking on a Thursday afternoon, a cry would go across the studio, goodbye, real world. And he used to say that we left the real world and went into the... Now we've changed it round. We say that the fantasy is, is the real world, and the real world is Coronation right. Street, because we live in it so much, if you understand what I mean. <laughs> but the thing is, it's that great relationship that you build up with each other, and as you say, some people have come and unfortunately gone from Coronation Street. But we do want to see a clip, and this one you will remember, I think, very clearly, because you starred in it very strongly. And it goes back to the time of the mission, when uh, there was a threatened gas leak in the street, oh, and all of you were in the mission. It was yes. terrific. <laughs> And you can turn that thing off to start. <laughs> and don't all stand gawping at me, I live here. We know. Did you say something, Mrs. Tanner? Yes, I did, Mrs. Sharples. And while I'm about to, I'll say something else. It's bad enough being chucked out of your house. And having to stay the night here is a damn start worse. But when you start chucking your flaming weight about, that's the limit. And if we want a bit of music, we shall have a bit of music. Oh, will you? We'll see about that. Were you wanting something, Mrs. Sharples? Because if you were, we might get the idea that we're not welcome here. And if we did get that idea, you wouldn't be welcome at our house. If that thing disturbs me in the vestry, I'm having the police in. And don't you get big-headed Jack Walker. I can soon find myself another pub. <laughs> <laughs> See, I enjoyed that. Come on, let's show her. Roll out the barrel. Let's have <laughs> Tremendous. Yeah. You know, but when you think of episodes like that being sold all over the world, what, to 17 countries, it's been seen in all five continents, what do they make of Coronation Street and places like Japan, for Arkansas? sake? They identify. I tell you, I had, uh, oh, many years ago, when I'd had an enormous row with Ina Sharples, I got a letter written in pidgin English from somewhere in Lime, Limehouse, uh, enclosed two pounds, because Dennis had apparently stolen two pounds out of one of my ornaments at the time to make up for it. And also a note saying that if Ina Sharples upset you, we cut head off. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, people get, you know, terribly involved in it. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we had a death in the street, uh, um, a make-believe death, we'd get wreaths and letters and weeping and everything. And, uh, and when, I had, uh, when I married the American in the street, uh, there was one famous story about um, they'd all got their seats laid out in one certain household and their mother dashed upstairs to put her best coat and hat on.
to come down and sit in the chair in the lounge and watch me getting married to Steve Tanner. Oh, it's yeah. tremendous. The other thing that surprises me, not surprises me, but when you think of the generation change, you've got a whole new generation now, and say so young people are really hooked on Coronation Street. It's lovely. It is. It's. It's very. It isn't so lovely sometimes. Where a young, handsome young man dashed up to me the other day and said, "Mrs. Tanner, I've loved you all my life. I've been in love with you." ever since I was two. <laughs> you should feel your age. <laughs> um, yes, it, uh, we think it's lovely to see the generations grow up. I mean, the amazing thing is that you say to some of the kids, do you remember so and And they've no idea. People that have been part of the life of Coronation Street. And then it's a tight community feeling as well, isn't it, that a lot of young people haven't experienced, you know, people living in, in close I proximity to each other. If you would, you would ask me, I think that is main and the secret of the success of Coronation Street. It is a community. People are locked together, even if they in the script don't like each other. There is a community living together and I think in this day and age this is what is needed. Uh, a community spirit. People are seeming to be spread far apart and life is not as it was. Well I know that you have some tremendous fans throughout the world and Jim Callaghan, just to keep it very much on a local base, has said that you are the sexiest lady on television. Oh that's a lot of years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but... Do you think you're still going to be there in another 22 years? Oh yes, you know Know, sort of bald and toothless and <laughs> <laughs> probably yes. Well the very best of luck and I know that everybody will like to wish you that as well. Pat Phoenix, thank you very much. Thank you.